that's one o'clock, so um, I'll kick us off if that's okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Stuart Barnes, and um, I'm based in Grimsby with the ORE Catapult. Um, many of you I know, uh, also though many I don't, so uh, really good to, to meet with you virtually. Uh, I'm pleased that you could join us. I can see we've got um, about 79 uh, participants and rising, so I'm glad some have made it back from lunch and uh, hopefully a, an interesting um, next session on uh, clean maritime in offshore wind. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen <clears throat> and talk through uh, very briefly the plans for this afternoon session. Okay, could someone please just give me a give me a nod to confirm when they can see the slides? Yeah, we've got that, Stuart. <clears throat> Fantastic. See that. So as I say, my name's Stu Barnes. Um, I'm with the ORE Catapult based in the Humber. Um, I've been with the Catapult for uh, three years now. Um, and prior to that, I've been uh, working in renewables for around 10 years. Um, first with one of the Carbon Trust subsidiaries and then with RES Offshore, uh, principally focused on development and consenting of round three wind farms. Um, <clears throat> I do apologise as well. I've just had a, a dog walker turn up. There's not much I can talk about that. So, so please just accept my apologies. Timing is impeccable. Um, <clears throat> okay, so very briefly then, uh, this uh, one and a half hour session will focus on clean maritime in offshore winds. Um, and there's a, a, an agenda here, as you can see, I'm gonna give a, a 10 minute opening. Um, and then we've got some fantastic speakers from across a, a mix of um, industry, trade associations, um, uh, and the innovation ecosystem, if you like. So um, uh, I'm not going to go as far as introducing these people, but um, you can see the names on the list here, and I'm sure they'll do a, a great job of introducing themselves. And I know they've got some really interesting uh, subject content to, to talk through today, uh, which I hope will stimulate conversation. Uh, and you can see from the agenda here, lots of time for questions um, and panel discussions, uh, as well as a, a round table session and at the end of the day, um, for which we would invite contributions uh, from the floor. So um, as we said at the beginning of the day, uh, please use the Q&A function as opposed to the chat function in Zoom. Uh, and we'll pick those questions up as they come through. And I've also been asked to remind people of the, uh, the hashtag um, for today's event, which is uh, hashtag Catapult Grimsby. Um, so any comments, any, any contributions on there would be uh, gratefully received as well. Okay, um, <clears throat> so as I say, I'll give a, a quick introduction uh, to the topic and, um, and then I'll hand over to the speakers. And, and I just, I suppose I wanted to take the opportunity to explain why it is that the ORE Catapult um, has decided to make uh, clean maritime in O&M one of its three main focus areas for, for the new innovation cluster in Grimsby. Uh, before then talking about some of the, the opportunities for the UK and, and for the industry um, and also some of the barriers that perhaps need to be overcome if we're to fully unleash the potential of, of clean maritime uh, within offshore wind. So in terms of context then, um, many of you will, will be well aware there's uh, a gradual kind of shift I suppose in government policy has been over many years, um, both in the UK, also across the EU and even at the IMO towards um, uh, varying uh, rates of decarbonizing maritime um, across all sectors. And uh, you can see some of the figures here. Maritime currently accounts for about 2.5% of global emissions. EU estimates that could rise to as much as 17% of global emissions by 2050 as other sectors um, begin to decarbonize. So the importance of, of decarbonizing this sector is, is really key in, in terms of the context of overall um, global emissions reduction. Uh, the UK has set some very uh, ambitious targets um, within its clean maritime plan. Uh, which many of you will be familiar with. Um, and there are a number of um, innovation uh, funding sources, uh, novel, novel funding sources, grant funding, um, which have been active for um, some years now. Uh, so Mary UK is, is, is one obvious one, and we're starting to see um, other innovation funding being made available to try and address some of the technical challenge areas here. Um, it's a really ambitious um, uh, set of objectives that have been set by a number of stakeholders. Um, both in industry and in government, and they will require large infrastructure adaptations, regulatory changes, and, and commercial adaptations as well, in order to, to accommodate the technology that's gonna be required to achieve uh, this decarbonization of maritime. Um, 
The O&M opportunity, and so all of that said, I, I just wanted to touch on why it is that I think this is of particular relevance to, to um, offshore wind and, and particularly uh, O&M. And I'll just uh, go through a couple of the points that you see on the screen here. I, I think O&M has an opportunity to act as a real kind of springboard industry, as Ben mentioned in his opening piece, um, and that's for a number of reasons. I think there are limited vessel numbers relative to, to the broader maritime sector, uh, and therefore, it's a, it's a conceivable and, and um, realistically achievable bite-sized chunk uh, to set aspirations for decarbonisation in this subsector. Um, typically, they're smaller vessels. I appreciate, you know, SOVs are not by any means small, but certainly compared to some of the much heavier vessels in other uh, sectors, such as freight and, and military, uh, we are dealing with smaller vessel types. Um, we've got a really innovative and, and capable supply chain within the UK, which covers uh, not just operation, um, key though that is, but also the design and manufacture of, of some of the, um, certainly CTD uh, vessels used in operations. Uh, we have an offshore power source, which I think offers some really interesting possibilities. So you've offshore wind, um, which could be used for, for offshore charging and or even old fuel production concepts in time. Um, and then, and then I think probably most important is actually the fact we've got some really committed industry leaders in, in the offshore wind industry. Um, I've pulled Orsted out here um, and, and highlighted them because I, I think it's probably fair to say they've been um, maybe the most uh, public and um, open in terms of some of their ambitions. Uh, 2025 target for net zero operations and maintenance, um, which is, is you know, clearly really challenging. Um, but there are others, and, and I know speaking with many of the OEMs and developers um, that we work with, they're in the, form, in, in, in the process of developing plans and um, well on their way to sort of announcing, I'm sure, in time their own targets and, and beginning to decarbonise their operations too. Um, so the current state then, not, not to labour the point, and I've deliberately picked out any operators and highlighted their vessels, but, you know, clearly uh, current norm is... is um, uh, marine diesel, high emissions, uh, obviously people are making adaptations in order to sort of drive down um, consumption, reduce emissions, but nevertheless that, that is current state. Um, limited port side infrastructure uh, and or electrical uh, or alt fuel infrastructure, and there are a number of challenges associated with introducing that, um, including grid constraints and others, um, and little or no uh, offshore infrastructure, um, including offshore charging or old fuel capability for vessels in field. And limited UK demonstration. I'll come on to, to sort of highlight what I mean there in just a moment. Um, in contrast, uh, desired kind of future state. I, I mean, the details I'm sure um, we, we might need to work through, but I'm sure most would agree, you know, 100% conversion to zero emissions O&M. And, and I've, I've indicated 2035 here as a possible date for, for this. It's vision setting, so I, I wouldn't get too tied down in, in that date, but I think that, that is conceivable. Um, UK industry and design and, and manufacturing operation, uh, large export market. I think um, the Clean Maritime Plan suggests an 11 billion um, global market for alt fuel uh, alone. That's aside from all the propulsion systems and, and vessel <laughs> markets. Um, so huge export potential. Um, and by going first in offshore wind, given all those uh, positive attributes that the, the offshore wind um, uh, marine operations has in its favour, uh, by, by moving first there, um, it will create opportunities in all sorts of other uh, maritime uh, subsectors as well. So the learning will be taken, I'm sure, and, and uh, uh, applied elsewhere. Um, there are barriers to achieving that, that vision. I'm going to read these out loud. Um, many will be familiar to, to, to those of you on the call. Um, I mean, most simple, perhaps, agreement on fuel type is, is a major stumbling block. And um, I, I don't think it's uh, right to assume there will be consensus on a single fuel type. Um, but therefore, we're going to need multiple systems potentially running in, in uh, parallel with one another to provide various alternative fuel production and distribution. Um, channels and, and that creates all sorts of uh, market and, and regulatory challenges. Um, there is uh, an absence of standards in many of the areas, um, so there's going to have to be development and agreement on um, standards moving forward. Uh, it's a complex landscape and it's a, a multinational landscape with um, players from across Europe and beyond. Um, 
And so bringing people together to try and develop uh, common standards and, and, and drive forward the developments in unison is, is obviously a challenge. Um, and it's difficult to bring consortia together uh, in places to work on this. And the logos you see here, um, <clears throat> the reason I include them is they were all partners to uh, an innovation um, grant submission that we made uh, probably a year or so ago um, to develop an offshore charging concept. And I, I recall distinctly one of the comments from the assessors at the time uh, <clears throat> was that it was an awful lot of money to invest in something that would benefit industry partners and therefore industry should be paying for it. And it, it kind of struck me really because the industry, what was being proposed was the development of a common standard for offshore charging. So the standard would have benefited the whole of the industry. Um, and yet we were locked in this chicken and egg where the assessors felt unable to award uh, the grant funding because the direct benefit in this particular case was going to the, the partners. Um, yet they lacked the, the I suppose, uh, willingness to I suppose, make that investment up front given actually this is something that the whole industry will develop from. So you get these kind of commercial impasses, I suppose is the point I'm trying to highlight here, um, which is another barrier. <coughs> um, so demonstration and early adoption of some of these technologies, I just wanted to highlight, I suppose, three uh, significant projects, which, which I think um, attest to the fact that, you know, elsewhere in, in Europe, um, things are perhaps moving a little more apace than, than they are here in the UK. So, a uh, couple of demonstrators you'll be familiar with, these have come through the Carbon Trust OWA um, uh, Vessels Working Group and uh, both are being demonstrated, but, you know, Sea Wind and, and Wind Cap, fantastic concepts and it's great to see progress, but both being demonstrated in the Netherlands and as yet, certainly as far as I'm aware, I, I don't think there is uh, uh, either a, a hybrid or fully electric or um, hydrogen vessel being demonstrated in UK waters, but that's something I think we, we'd all love to see sooner rather than later. Um, another, another demonstration project, uh, this time in Norway, um, Equinor's uh, ammonia demonstrator. I think I recall it's somewhere in the region of two megawatt demonstrator, still, still in concept phase for the time being, but it's a, a funded R&D project which will, um, does plan to include full in-field demonstration uh, by 2024. And then this one, which I think is absolutely fantastic um, and really is kind of, I think, the benchmark of, of what we should be uh, looking to, um, if not replicate, certainly uh, achieve similar high standards. Copenhagen's um, uh, kind of partnership project looking at developing an electrolyzer for the production of hydrogen for use specifically in um, transport. So multiple project partners, uh, uh, Ørsted, Maersk, uh, DSV, DFTS and, and SAS Airlines as well as the city of Copenhagen um, and the figures you can see there 10 megawatt electrolyzer operating by 2023 with plans ultimately to go as high as uh, 1.3 gigawatts by 2030. Hugely ambitious. So the UK opportunity then, uh, I'll move through this very quickly, so I want to hand over to our speakers. Um, we have a, a kind of vision for a, a, the development of a globally unique innovation demonstration and certification cluster with the ability to combine the tech regulatory and commercial innovation, develop the whole system wind to wake, uh, zero carbon o and in offshore wind. In order to do that, we, we recognize it's not just a case of technical demonstration, it really is about this um, synergy between technical, commercial and regulatory innovation. And, and in effect, what I'm trying to say with this slide is that we need to bring together some products, some demonstration products, be that um, electrolyzers, electrical charging infrastructure, onshore and offshore, um, and, and, and demonstration and test assets to accompany all of that. But also we need to bring together the people um, and the processes uh, and by people um, really is such a broad, broad width of stakeholders required um, to look at the technical, the industry, the regulatory barriers and, and to overcome them. And the processes of um, technical appraisal, cost modeling, demonstration, verification, certification. So what we're proposing in effect and part of the focus of our work in Grimsby is to develop uh, a, a first of a kind one-stop shop for um, innovation development, demonstration, verification and certification. And this is, this is um, certainly ambitious but one of the other concepts we're looking at and engaging with stakeholders on is, is the concept of a, a net zero port of operations in Grimsby. Um, lots of stakeholders need to be taken on board and it's, it's very much the start of a, a kind of conversation and a process, but certainly speaking with, with government, with industry, 
uh, with port ownership and, and various others. This is a challenge, I suppose, that we would like to set to, to all the stakeholders involved to, to kind of come together. And um, if we're serious about achieving 2050 net zero operations, then what better place to begin to um, demonstrate at scale a, a whole holistic uh, system transition? Um, and so that's kind of, a, I guess, a beacon that we can focus on and begin to build challenges around. Uh, indicative timeline there. So in all seriousness, we, we do think that um, First demonstrations it could be coming online 2023, 24, with first products to market by 2025 on that um, route to uh, net zero O and M by 2035. Lots of work will have to be done. Lots of partners involved um, in order to achieve this, but I do, I do believe it's achievable. So that's all I wanted to say, a quick kind of whistle stop into some of the drivers and, and challenges, I suppose, as, as we see things. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to uh, Kerry Forster, who is uh, Chief Executive at the Workboat Association, who's going to give um, his view of the Clean Maritime Challenge and the offshore wind uh, opportunity before we then go into a panel discussion um, with, uh, with Kerry, with Ken Cochran from uh, Siemens Camisa and Bryn Smith at HST. So, uh, Kerry, over to you. Thanks very much, Stuart. And uh, yeah, welcome everyone today. I'm just going to try and uh, share my screen here. So, Please uh, bear with me a couple of seconds. Uh, I believe you should all be able to see this now. Can everyone see the presentation? Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. All right, so my name is Kerry Forster. I'm Chief Executive of the Workboat Association. We are the trade association for um, vessels under 500 tonnes in the UK. Um, and many people might have known us for, for works before. Um, in the offshore wind industry, for example, uh, collaborating with the G Plus on uh, exercises like the uh, Good Practice for Small Vessels in the Energy Sector Guide. Um, I'll put my details at the end of this presentation, so uh, any questions you can also forward to me following this. Um, Stuart asked me to, to talk to you about bringing the offshore wind maritime industry and some of the challenges and focuses in that. So. It's, it's a bit of a two-sided coin, really. Uh, if we think on one side, we have the near shore and the river and port operations, and on the other side, we have offshore operations. The needs for the, both of those markets differ quite substantially. Um, Stuart was speaking just now about some of the uh, carbon emission projects and demonstrations that have been happening outside of the UK. Um, and that's often been happening in areas close to ports as well, from our experiences. So we've seen the first hybrid tug vessels working in the harbour towage community, and we've seen some pilot vessel works as well, and, uh, and that is being trialled in the UK. Um, the reasons for this is you've got your vessels uh, closer to shore, um, looking at uh, modifying or tweaking or testing certain systems or actively engaging with the vessel is a lot easier, the closer to shore that it is. And it also means that you're closer to your fuel supply, whether that be for plug-in or, uh, or liquid or gas uh, fuel supply. Of course, when we're dealing with new fuels, um, it's always a focus of ours to minimize risk wherever possible. So offshore wind is a very professional industry. It's quite well self-regulated. Um, so that brings a, a very strong um, yeah, link with, with trialling of uh, future fuel types and decarbonisation projects. Uh, for a regulator, it's particularly hard, especially when looking at uh, designing and writing policy, how to regulate something that you don't quite understand yet. And really, we don't fully understand something until it's been used and operated for a substantial amount of time. But ways we can minimise the risks in this is by looking into well self-regulated industries like offshore wind to help to follow that process and to manage it in a safe and controlled environment. Also, we've got a lot of enthusiasm, as we heard earlier, especially from site operators, to support a green supply chain, which is fantastic. And it would be great as a, uh, a green energy uh, provider to also, uh, as an industry, put our hands up and say, our supply chain is also as green as we can possibly make it as well. And, and that, I believe, as a quotation, is quite a living quotation. Uh, to, to make 
our industry as green as we possibly can today will be very different to what we can say again in 10 years time. But we have to make sure that we proact proactively take the same footsteps together uh, and work towards that goal. And we need to strive for continual improvement internally within our own industry and our separate sectors. Um, if we think about the, the well-known quotation of if it ain't broke, don't fix it, what happens if you do want to fix it? Currently, we've got an industry that is working operationally well, offshore and onshore. Um, why would we want to change that? Now, I think uh, I'm not going to talk about the benefits of changing that. I think that's what the whole of today is about, and, and people do realise that. Um, but some things we need to consider um, for, for, you know, the big question of why we're all doing this is obviously to make money. So investment is going to be one of the first risks. Uh, this is both on board the vessels, uh, within the manufacturing supply chain, within the ports, and possibly even offshore. As uh, Stuart mentioned earlier, um, putting... Uh, fueling or support stations onshore uh, may only be one side of that story and we may also need that offshore as well but that's something I'll come on to talk about. Uh, secondly, maybe we will affect, re affect reliability and durability of vessels. Uh, by changing uh, systems on board, how does that also um, change other systems, the control systems, operating systems, fuel management systems, etc. Reliability and durability will be questioned when we look into future fuel usages. Um, also, capacity, um, you know, weights and spaces of, of this equipment will change. Uh, that might have an effect on the amount of people that we're able to safely uh, have on board vessels unless we change the size of vessels dramatically. And it may also have an effect on the amount of equipment we're able to take on vessels. Um, if we all think about the, the iPhone 1, for example, or one of your first laptop computers, uh, battery sizes or, or, or equipment sizes were very different to what people have in their pockets or uh, on their desks today. Um, and, and that would be the same for a lot of the, the power chain systems for our vessels as well. It will have effects on uh, sailing duration. Again, um, phones keep getting better all the time. My phone now manages to last for two days, but only two years ago, well, my phone only managed one day, and I don't think my usage has particularly changed very much. Um, this is just uh, evolution of the technical systems, and this will again be affected in, in the offshore wind industry, or particularly greening of the maritime industry, and that's whether the vessel is large or small. Speed of vessels will be changed. This is for two reasons. Again, a change in vessel design or a change in transmission design and possibly also because of the torque or the power output from the new systems that we'll be trialing. Weather windows may also be affected, especially when we talk about torque, when we talk about speed over water or speed over ground, um, that affects duration. But what happens when we're offshore and we're actually in operation on the wind farm? How will your station keeping capability be if you're on DP? How will your, uh, your, your ride comfort be if you're waiting in the wind farm. How will the push-on be? Uh, will you have a static push-on? Will the weather window decrease, for example, through uh, a different torque on the vessel, through a different power chain? And also running costs. Uh, eventually, we hope that we aim for a reduction of running costs, but we may also see that running costs uh, increase. At the beginning, I, I believe that, that we will see an increase in running costs, especially because uh, we've discussed before uh, openly in the industry that taxes will need to be uh, to look at and review, especially for, for future fuels types, um, but also the maintenance and uh, um, well, proactive and reactive maintenance costs and, and the original purchase and, and design costs for the new equipment that will be on board vessels. But we have a fantastic opportunity in the UK now. The UK is investing time, money, and resources into a national shipbuilding strategy, um, which we hope that in offshore wind and also within the offshore contracting industry being non-passenger and non-freight, um, that we'll be able to have a large stake within this, uh, this new strategy within the UK. And together with that link to what will lead to a rejuvenation of our coastal communities of which as a nation is proud uh, to have. Um, one of those, is, as Stuart said, uh, being Grimsby, as we look to, to, to potential for Grimsby to be the first zero emission port. Um, many of us can think about what Grimsby uh, uh, fish docks in, in the area 
um, were 10 years ago. And I think if we look at it now, uh, there'll be people that don't recognize it. Um, so hopefully we can all uh, use this as a way to try and uh, change the infrastructure in the UK as well with the, with the structured and progressive system. So, um, I have no link to these uh, uh, magazines, but I've tried to, to uh, or I saw uh, a number of pictures on these magazines, uh, which really sum up our industry quite well on the title. The vessels used in offshore wind are vast. Um, no one of them particularly looks the same, and they all fulfill very different jobs. And that also means a very different need from the power chain systems on board those vessels, whether they are large or small or as we see here with additional lifting capacities or accommodation or service capacities, or whether it's you know, high torque uh, jobs like the vessels we see on the left with the tugboats. Um, speed is also an, uh, an issue, uh, as we see on the right hand side of the screen here as well, some, some you know, high speed crew transfer vessels supplied by Diamond there. Um, for them, they're looking at the, what power management chain can put on board vessels that, that can keep vessels running at a, an efficient way for long periods of time at high speed. Now, Stuart mentioned the Clean Maritime Plan. Uh, I was very proud to be at the launch of the Clean Maritime Plan in the UK. Uh, in fact, I was standing just next to the, the cameraman when this picture was taken, which was, uh, which was great. It's very ambitious, as we heard. Um, although I think internally within the wind industry, we also have very ambitious clients, which one might say is, is a challenge, but to me, I think it's a fantastic opportunity. Uh, we're, again, self-supporting, supporting each other and supporting our supply chain, at least at the moment, with intent um, to be one of the leaders in greening of the maritime supply chain. Now, a couple of things for people that don't know uh, the Clean Maritime Plan, and I'll make sure it's shared as, as part of today. Um, in 2050, zero emission ships are a commonplace globally. The UK has taken a proactive role in driving the transition to zero emission shipping in UK waters and is seen globally as a role model in this field. Moving faster than any other country uh, and faster than international standards. As a result, the UK has successfully captured a significant share of the economic, environmental and health benefits associated with this transition. That's the UK's aim for 2050 in the maritime sector. Before that though, there is a route map and there are a couple of stepping stones, one of them being 2025. The UK expects that all vessels operating in UK waters are maximizing the use of energy efficient options. All new vessels being ordered for the use in UK waters are being designed with zero emission propulsion capabilities. Now that's a pretty bold statement, I think. Um, also, the UK is building clean maritime clusters focused on innovation and infrastructure associated with zero emission propulsion technologies, including bunkering of low or zero emission fuels. And I think today is a fantastic uh, example of how those clusters are already uh, forming and, and running. And uh, a number of the, the names I see here have been part of other meetings and groups that, that I've had on the topic. And we're in discussion at the moment with the, the UK government about forming an official workboat cluster um, as part of this plan. In 2035, we expect that the UK has built a number of clean maritime clusters uh, to combine infrastructure innovation um, and low or zero emission marine fuel bunkering options are already available across the UK. Um, we want to be known as the global leader in clean shipping and the UK is home to a world leading zero emissions maritime sector with a strong UK export industry, a cutting edge research and development and global centre for investment insurance and legal services related to clean maritime growth. So more in that document. Um, now, I, I picked these two vessels again. <laughs> They're not my pictures, so I apologize uh, if I've stolen people's pictures and they're unhappy, but two of the, the people that are speaking today. Um, so we've got very different uh, vessels here, a, a typical crew transfer vessel, and we'll hear from Leo, uh, the owner of this vessel soon. And on the left there, the, the Bibby Wavemaster, um, an OSV working actively in the offshore wind industry, 
we said earlier, vessel, different vessels have different needs, and these two very much show that there is different needs for, for each of these. But the, the question on my head is, is really at all times, what comes first? Do we build green vessels to speculation, or the charter is wishing that vessel owners catch up? And this is something that together, in, in you know, talks like we have today, we can hopefully steer to make sure that we both expectation um, and commitment from both sides of the supply chain uh, are met at the same time. And also that the manufacturers and builders of shipyards are ready for this as well. Uh, if we look here, um, for example, in the race bank, CTVs will be moving backwards and forwards a number of times. Sometimes it happens a, a number of times in one day as well. Um, OSVs generally are staying offshore for longer periods of time and possibly only coming back to the order bunker or crew change uh, once per month. Now, obviously, if we want to reduce uh, the carbon footprint of our industry, one of the thing we can, things we can do is, is better management of our of, uh, movements. Now, that is a continued, continually developing situation. Uh, and as we see uh, from the maritime plan, one of the stepping stones towards achieving clean maritime is first to record our CO2 outputs, and that's all part of the management of these unnecessary navigation. Um, but we do see that the roles that those vessels perform are also different. And as we go further offshore, this will of course be an, an increased uh, problem. Now, if we go to fuel vessels onshore and run offshore and come back, that may be possible. It depends on the size of the vessel. It depends on the type of fuel that's being used or the, the technology that's being used. But there is a, the further that we go offshore, there is a more need that we will potentially have to recharge offshore. And again, as I said earlier, whether that's uh, recharging electrically or if it's recharging through, through gas or, or fuel, uh, sorry, liquid fuel systems, um, to support a full demonstration and, and operational test of, of future fuels and transition systems in the maritime industry, we will need to think about uh, supporting both sides of this movement. Um, it might not necessarily be something that will be around forever, um, but it may be something that is necessary to, to make us take that first step. And a picture that Stuart used earlier, so I'm glad I used the same one. Um, but if we look here, um, I believe it's Royal Docks at Grimsby, um, larger vessels in this area, now, if we think about fueling them currently, how are these vessels fueled? Generally, um, I think we can see here, and I, I don't know if you can see my cursor, probably not, if people can. Uh, on the, on the, the left-hand side, uh, SOV there, there's a fuel bunker lorry, and this is generally how uh, bunkers are being done at the moment. We, we have singular point fueling delivery systems where lorries, maybe one after another, uh, turn up generally within the same 24 hours, fuel the vessel up, and then the vessel proceeds to sea. Um, now, as we look into smaller vessels, and uh, hopefully I, I can uh, get off it. Then uh, this is also Grimsby, showing the crew transfer vessels. Um, a number of vessels together, it's only one corner of the docks there. Um, and and it, I'm sure a couple of years ago the picture was taken, but anyone that knows the area there, you'll often see a whole fleet uh, of, of crew transfer vessels or support vessels in the area, and they are taking fuel uh, from uh, a multiple point bunkering system, normally being in this situation here, an onshore bunkering facility where the vessels can turn up one after another and take fuel from the same system. So if we look to delivering fuel for future technologies and putting in the infrastructure for that, we first need to know what fuel it is that needs to be delivered. And this brings risks as well. For instance, if we would be building a substation to deliver electrical fuel for future uh, vessels, maybe you do not want that next to hydrogen storage facilities. Um, again, chicken and egg, what comes first? What is the preferred fuel source? In a demonstration project, it may need to be that we think about uh, putting in smaller versions of these systems uh, uh, spaced further apart within the same area so that we can support multiple demonstrations at once. But that will also mean that the fueling or charging may necessarily need to be done uh, quicker than often as well. 
Um, so therefore we need to think about flexibility. And uh, close to the end now, but uh, it does bring problems. Again, as you talk about capacities, capacities in the future will get uh, smaller, lighter, better. But to begin with, it will be a small uphill battle. Um, fuel, running out of fuel may be uh, uh, something that does happen um, and we want to avoid it. Um, and the systems will be larger and heavier uh, than hopefully we will end up being. But the first step to be taken. Um, that's really it from me. Uh, so I hope I haven't gone on too long. Um, but that's my details. And uh, if anyone uh, has any interest to, to discuss further any of the opportunities or, or any technologies they believe need to be looked at in the market, then please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. And uh, thank you very much for listening. That's excellent. Thank you, Kerry. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we, at this point, we were due to have a, a panel session and, and Q&A. Um, I'm a little bit conscious of time though. I set the tone by overrunning slightly and, and uh, we're a bit behind time. So what I'm going to propose we do is consolidate the two panel discussions into a single one, which we'll take uh, after the next uh, next presentations. So um, uh, Ken, Bryn, if you're happy to do that, we'll, uh, we'll just hold fire for uh, 15 minutes or so, um, take the presentations on innovation in the UK supply chain, and then we'll have a combined uh, panel and, and Q&A session. Uh, which means then, uh, Leo, if you're there, I think you're first on my list. Um, as I say, we're, we're going to hear now from uh, at least three, potentially four innovators who have um, innovative products or services uh, in clean maritime. Um, and then after those speed presentations, speed pitches, I've, I've referred to them as, uh, we'll then have a, a panel discussion and invite questions from, uh, from those of you on the call. Okay, so over to you, Leo. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just uh, going to try and get this uh, set up properly. Sorry, and then share the right screen. Otherwise, we'll see too much. Hold on. Uh, hold on. Where has it gone? Hold on. It's always one. I'm sorry, it's me today. Um, <laughs> Share screen. Leo, if there's a couple of technical, oh no, it looks like it's coming on. Is that <clears throat> is that going to be okay? Yeah, you might want to put it in uh, slide mode. Does that, does that work? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Cool. Excellent. So thank you very much for having me. Um, so Tidal Transit is a crew, uh, crew transfer of a vessel owner and operator. Um, we have been working for all the major um, uh, utilities owning the wind farms um, and the um, uh, providers or the OEMs of the turbines. Um, we've got pretty good experience, therefore, on uh, what the uh, industry is looking for. But uh, we are obsessed as a company of trying to uh, realize greater efficiencies where possible. And when this goes forward into the future, this is about trying to reduce fuel usage and actually eliminating diesel altogether uh, out of the um, out of the of the, um, the operational profile. So um, uh, da, 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 da. I have just going to make sure that we are in here. So yeah, the fleet of vessels. We don't need to talk about those, but uh, this is our fleet of six vessels. Um, um, but really, we need to look at the industry as a whole. Um, the industry has a huge carbon footprint um, from all the various different vessels that are utilized in the industry. The um, uh, it, it is it varies from uh, from the jack ups through the survey vessels through to the CTVs, uh, and really annoyingly, I've just realised that I've actually just pulled up the wrong presentation because this has got way too many slides in it. So I'm going to skip a few. So don't worry. Um, uh, the the real key thing about this though is as, as a as a global as part of the global shipping industry, there is a global aim to reduce CO2 across the, across the industry uh, as a whole, as part of the IMO um, uh, regulations. Uh, there is an aim to do this by 2050. And actually, the offshore wind industry is perfectly placed to be able to show the wider shipping industry how in various different um, uh, vessel categories, how this can be achieved. Uh, we specifically have been looking at um, where you can save fuel through operational uh, efficiency. 
through technological efficiency, but also by alternative fuels. Um, and for, for smaller vessels, this is uh, limited to uh, what you can carry on board the boat um, in terms of battery sizes or, or, or hybrid options. Um, we have looked into the different, uh, different opportunities for hydrogen and electricity and have struggled to, to find the commercial benefit of doing hydrogen on a small size vessel because of the weight of fuel cells and the pro problems of um, uh, carrying hydrogen and therefore focus more on electricity. And although electricity has its problems because of battery sizes, it, we've found a way forward for this. As an industry, um, uh, the, the, this is not new. Uh, batteries, battery solutions and, and hydrogen solutions are being used elsewhere in, a, in the shipping industry, but we're ready to go, go, go that bit further. Um, uh, so it, with regards to hydrogen and electricity, the big issue is infrastructure. Uh, we need to find a, a common uh, marine connector, uh, which we are working with various different parties on, on um, trying to uh, standardize both for onshore and offshore training, uh, uh, charging I should say. Um, but the, the, the capacities that we're talking about are three times, if not four times, what is already available onshore for cars. So it, realizing that we that there has to be a, there's a quite a big step required still to make this uh, uh, feasible. Um, we have come up with, however, with a solution where our existing fleet, because of the way that they were designed with a a, a, a future potential in, in play, are already capable in terms of uh, size and hull size um, and uh, design to be able to carry the additional battery weight that would be required for turning them from being a diesel burner through to being the Tesla of the sea. Um, but it's a, the, the one thing that everyone will say is, well, what about range? Range is a big issue. Range is a big issue for whether you're at sea or, or on the road. A 9,000 liter fuel tank in our existing vessels will do 600 miles. A seven, and that weighs about nine tons. A 17 ton battery pack of about 1.7 uh, megawatts will give us about 30 miles. But luckily, offshore wind farms are not 300 miles from shore. And there are many projects that are very near shore, both in the UK and, the, and, in, and, and other parts of, uh, of Europe, where we could already use existing vessels repowered with electricity to, uh, to access and service them. So we like, we like, we'd like to introduce you to our Electra, which is the, uh, a retrofit of our existing vessels um, uh, based on uh, full electrification. Um, and that is really just an intro from us. But you know, we are, we're, we're, we're quite far in the development of this. We've, we've outlined battery suppliers, motor manufacturers. We've talked to some of the OEMs about this. Um, but what are the stumbling blocks to get us to fruition? Um, making sure the infrastructure is in place for charging. Um, having a, the buy-in from one of the utilities that they really want to be able to show their green credentials by going um, to a full battery solution, which will, as Kerry pointed out before, initially cost them more but in the long run this is how by encouraging innovation into new technology and bringing this technology in you are reducing the costs of the future so we are ready ready today thank you that's superb thanks leo um appreciate that presentation and we'll bring you back in as i say for the the panel and the q a uh, after the next two presentations so um next on my list then i've got uh, rob osborne who's at bbms Rob, are you there? Are you ready? Yes, I am. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone is well. I'll just share my screen. Guys, can you see that? Looks like it's on its way. Yeah, nearly. Yeah, that's there now. Fantastic. So today I'll be talking to you about Bibby Marine Services Wavemaster Zero Sea project. So as is quite clear from, uh, from, from our talks today and, and, and as you see in the news, climate change is one of the biggest threats to humanity at present and for future generations. And as such, it's imperative that all industries decolonize to throw actively to mitigate further damage. Bibby, uh, currently, if you're not aware of the company, we operate two walks of work SOVs, the Wavemaster Fleet, and these are marine diesel burning vessels working on wind farms in the North Sea. 
With the development of alternative fuel powertrains, marine operators can begin the greenification of their operations, thus decarbonizing the supply chain and reducing carbon emissions. What Bibby wants to add is best. I've just had a message come up saying my internet is unstable. Is this coming through all right? It's a bit patchy. Hello? Yeah, a bit patchy, Rob. You might want to try okay. uh, switching your video off. I shall do that. Okay, hopefully this is better. If not, just give us a, a nudge. Yeah, we can hear you well now. Okay, okay. So, why are we doing this? I've just said. Um, the, the Wavemaster Zero Sea Vessel um, project will determine the best zero carbon fuel for SOVs, not just for Bibby, hopefully, and thus medium to large size vessels. In the market at the moment with demonstrators and research and development, we are currently seeing that CTVs, tugboats, uh, uh, ferries, uh, where you get most of the, uh, the alternative fuel sort of research at the moment, that research onto your bigger uh, tankers, carriers, your, your transocean vessels, where you will get most of the uh, of the four percent of global carbon emissions. This project will consider the technical, environmental, and economic challenges facing a transition to zero carbon shipping. We're not just looking to see what's the best uh, technical viable solution, because everything will 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 need to have a price. Someone needs to pick up the check at the end of the day. Um, so we're looking to the best route towards commercialization uh, for our 2050 and indeed interim objectives. But not only will this consider our vessel technology, but also the land side operations associated, such as the fuel supply, storage and bunkering, and thus the infrastructure, which has already been talked about as one of the main barriers towards the implementation of green technology in Madison projects um, having received grant funding from Mari UK. We have a 200 year old history of adapting to market challenges in Maritime and this is just the latest. Currently Bibby Marine Services are the sole British SOB operator and as such we feel we must take the initiative to drive green UK maritime growth in our sector. We will however not be doing this alone, we've got a fantastic team that we've managed to collate um, who are industry experts from across the board who will help to drive the Wave Master Zero Sea projects. So, as you may or may not be aware, Darman are the designers of the existing Wave Master vessel, which is the ASV 9020 hull. Using this hull as the basis uh, of a zero carbon vessel, Darman will lead the design of five alternative fuel concepts, and they are biofuel, hydrogen, ammonia, methanol and a full electric battery solution. The five are present in the UK's vision of British Maritime in 2050, uh, the Clean Maritime Plan, and that's all technologies that the market has to offer at this stage. Alongside Darman and Bibby, we also have Lloyd's Register, who will be leading the technical safety and regulation analysis of each vessel. This is just an initial standpoint before going into uh, more, more detailed sort of uh, line of inquiries at a later stage. Uh, Ricardo, environmental consultancy, will be doing an initial high level analysis of all fuels, uh, considering a range of operation cycles before narrowing it down after a selection workshop. This selection workshop will also take into account the financial and business case, which uh, EFC Energy Solutions will be doing. Uh, they will be assessing the business cases and, and the market preparedness of each vessel from a Bibby's perspective. And we've also got Holder Consultancy, who will be, design, who will be designing a core concept based 
based on the British Isles that could serve as an old fuel wave master. Also looking into the landside requirements of generation supply any handling. Uh, finally, ORE Catapults, who have been very, uh, very gracious in giving us platforms today, so thank you, Stuart and Dean. Um, they will be aiding with surrounding research help collate wider industry feedback. Finally, is this just a one-off? No. Uh, this forms part of a much larger vision in which we want to develop a zero carbon vessel. This is just the foundation step for it. We wish to proactively switch from fossil fueled vessel to zero carbon fueled vessels before any legislation comes in. Through this investigation, Bibi can determine the best future fuel for larger vessels, benefiting hopefully not only Bibi, but the wider industry and supply chain. This project is already influencing our live tender opportunities regarding fits our existing fleet, looking into the efficiencies, as mentioned earlier, of our operations, and we seek to have a large impact on how the UK maritime sector tackles clean shipping. We hope that this is a real catalyst. Um, here is our, our team involved with the Wavemaster Zero Sea projects. These are the people who have provided the letter of support so far, and if you would like any more information on the matter, could you please contact either Kevin Brown, who's the project director, or myself, Rob Osborne, who is the project manager. That is all I've got for you today. Um, so I shall pass on. That's fantastic. Thank you, Rob. Uh, really appreciate that presentation. Um, and now uh, to, to wrap up the uh, list of presenters on uh, UK innovations, we've got um, uh, Paul Cairns at MJR and I think possibly Ryan as well. Um, but Paul, over to you. Yeah, I'll just uh, share my screen. Hold on a minute, sorry about that. Let me know when you can see that. Yeah, we've got that now, Paul. Yeah, great. Well, thanks, Stuart. Thanks for inviting us to, uh, to participate in, in this event. Um, obviously, my name for everybody else is Paul Cairns. I'm MD of um, MJR Power and Automation. We're a marine power systems engineering company with, with 30 years experience of marine offshore and subsea electrical engineering and project delivery. Um, I've got a significant amount of background in renewables, uh, having worked on several offshore uh, wind farm installation packages, cable installation packages, uh, specifically sharing them shore uh, in field and export uh, for Statcraft Statoil. And uh, London Array, uh, on behalf of VSMC, uh, I think it's now uh, Boscalis Subsea Cables. So um, who are we? Uh, MGR is based in Stockton-on-Tees in the northeast of England. Uh, we're a, a leading specialist independent marine and offshore electrical power and automation systems company uh, with a track record spanning 25 years uh, in the industry with a robust reference list and we're active in commercial shipping, offshore construction, and renewable energy. Uh, we count many of the UK's leading vessel owners and operators as our customers. Uh, we provide them with electrical power systems engineering services, uh, covering consultancy, advisory services, project management, new build, upgrades, and retrofits. We're uh, marine and offshore solutions partners with uh, some of the largest and most well-known equipment manufacturers uh, particularly Siemens, uh, who we, we do a lot of work with and deliver their products into uh, quite a lot of our solutions. Um, we support the UK renewables industry uh, and we're members, members of the um, NOF Energy Coast Industry Cluster. Uh, we have a staff of, uh, of 35 uh, with a mixture of electrical engineers, software engineers, technicians and installation personnel. And we spend about 10% of our company turnover on, uh, on R&D activities. Uh, what do we do? We provide uh, vessel owners and operators, offshore construction companies and equipment manufacturers with electrical control, uh, automation, engineering services for vessel upgrades, uh, back deck equipment, production machines, test rigs, um, and product validation equipment for novel wave and tidal power generation systems. We, we produce 
uh, feed studies, consultancy, uh, equipment and systems design, uh, installation commissioning, and we offer uh, a full end engineering procurement installation service. So typical project examples are um, power and propulsion upgrades and retrofits for commercial shipping, uh, cable umbilical production line upgrades, uh, equipment and, and installation. Uh, cable and umbilical fatigue, test rig, alternation systems, containerized power solutions for subsea equipment and trenches. Um, we specialize in uh, offshore drive train system design. Uh, we deliver packages for cable layer, um, cable installation, pipe layer, tensioners, winches, carousels and reelers. And we've done a lot of work in hybrid uh, propulsion and energy storage. Uh, and we do a lot of vessel mobilization projects. So specific strategic areas of interest for us are decarbonization of marine and ports covering electric hybrid propulsion, uh, offshore charging, which we're quite active in, uh, in, in doing research and development on, um, containerized shorter ship power solutions and energy recovery for lifting and deployment operations. Um, so yeah, so that's a bit about our company. Uh, I don't know whether you have any questions. That's great, thank you, Paul. Um, I think what we'll do now is bring in uh, the other the other presenters. Um, we were due to have uh, Rob Stewart, who's um, the MD at uh, AMC on the Isle of Wight, join us and talk about his offshore charging innovation, uh, the, the charge barge concept. Um, unfortunately, uh, Wi-Fi has let him down. Being on the Isle of Wight, I think it's often an issue. So, um, if we could have uh, Leo, Rob, and Paul uh, leave your cameras on. Um, and then I'd also like to bring in, as I mentioned before, uh, Ken and Bryn. Um, and if uh, if the two of you could just introduce yourselves once you've got cameras up. Hi, Stuart. I think somebody needs to turn on my camera. It's blocked for me. Okay. Um, I think. And the same for me as well, Stuart. Okay. If someone could sort that for. And Bryn, that would be great. Okay, Bryn, you've come on camera first, so if you want to just introduce yourself briefly. Uh, yeah, my name's Bryn Smith. Uh, I'm the commercial manager at HST, um, who are the owner operators of uh, four Darman 2710 CTVs, uh, currently working across the North Sea. Uh, and we are, have just embarked on a new build program uh, for our first hybrid vessel, uh, which will be coming from a UK shipyard on the Isle of Wight, Diverse Marine, uh, designed by a UK designer, uh, Chartwell, uh, in Southampton, um, and hopefully coming to the market to deliver uh, hybrid solutions to customers by the middle of next year. Excellent, thank you. And then, uh, Ken, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself as well. Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Ken Coughlin. I work for Siemens Gamesa in the operation and maintenance side of the business and I work in the maritime team. So our responsibility is to, to develop this, this area of the business to ensure we are carbon neutral by 2050. So a big challenge, but of course we have lots of good partners to work with to achieve it. Excellent, thanks Ken. Um, so at this point I would invite people to uh, submit questions um, via the Q&A function. Um, and in fact, let's kick off with this one. There's a question that's come in from uh, Ian, Ian Corder, uh, who has asked, where does funding tend to come from uh, for electrified vessels? Is it different for retrofits versus new builds? Are there any issues with accessing external funding for these projects? So, um, Leo, I'll pick you out because I know from, from experience you've, you've looked at this. Um, how have you found the ability to sort of access uh, funding to support the development of an electric CTV? Uh, well, well, without wanting to, to steal the thunder of somebody else's presenting, uh, we've definitely found uh, the, the, the funding opportunities available, um, both from uh, one of the major o OEMs in terms of, uh, not, sorry, not OEMs, in terms of um, utilities, being able to encourage uh, investments into the green sector. But also, uh, for what we're looking at, the, the real major cost of, um, of electrification is the investment into batteries um, uh, as being the most heavily capital intensive area. But there are leasing opportunities from most of the major, major, major battery manufacturers. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not too scared about that side, actually. Um, 
the, and and as for uh, funding for, for new versus retrofit, um, I think it, it depends on the health form and, um, and, the, and the condition and quality of the boat. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Leo. Um, a question that's come through from Graham Foster um, regarding SOVs this time. So Rob, I'll, I'll direct this one at you if I may initially. Um, talking about maximizing UK content and highlighting the fact that larger SOVs tend to be built, well, are built outside the UK. Um, so, you know, how do you reconcile that? The fact that the, the vessel is built outside the UK, but nevertheless, we need to stimulate uh, the, the UK supply chain. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a very good question from Graham um, and is something that we are conscious of at Bibby. Uh, we are actively liaising uh, lines of inquiry with UK shipyards. Um, what we've seen, however, still is that for, for the vessel design, um, we're still uh, we're still ending up going abroad because it's not as, uh, as as mature, if you like. For what for what we're uh, wanting to see, um, but it is something that ultimately, if we are going to harness the full potential of the UK, something that we need to have more development in, and we need to also get more of the of the of the market of trusting and and getting uh, getting business with UK operators. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Rob. Um, Kerry, I guess just on, on that uh, topic about UK supply chain and UK content in offshore wind vessels, um, you mentioned earlier the shipbuilding strategy that you've been in, involved with and consulting with government on. Um, I mean, do, what, what, what future do you see for um, potential building of, of larger SOV vessels here in the UK? Is that something that you think is uh, conceivable in the, in the sort of medium to long term? Um, at the moment, I'd say that the um, what is conceivable is especially the fitting out of larger vessels in the UK. Uh, we have a, a fantastic manufacturing uh, sector in the UK, especially for marine systems, uh, if not for, for large capacity shipyards. Um, one first stepping stone to, to getting uh, manufacturing back in the UK may be to do the second uh, secondary task fitment of vessels, um, having them built elsewhere where um, skills and uh, shipyard availability and, and operation is available and then having the skills that are in the UK now and resources and, and uh, opening up to, to you know, the largest supply chain to be finished off in the UK, that is definitely an achievement welcome. Yeah, okay, that's helpful, thank you. Um, there's a question I'm, I'm going to uh, ask if that's okay because it's, it's one I'm really curious about which is um, the, the lifetime cost modelling uh, for some of the clean maritime technologies, whether it's alternative fuel or, or electric. Obviously, um, you know, the offshore wind has seen huge cost reduction, as, as was mentioned earlier. And with that comes, a, 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 you know, cost pressures on, on operations, just as it does during construction and capex. So given the current price of, of oil um, and the impact that's probably had on operating costs of, of traditional conventional CTV and SOV, how does clean maritime begin to compete um, with, with those much lower uh, oil costs that, that presumably are driving down operational costs of current technology? Anyone want to pick that one up? <clears throat> Rob? Uh, actually, not really. I was, I was just kind of say, yes, I am here. So if anybody okay, wants to hear what AMC do, I'm very happy to, to do it if I'm not out of time. Yeah, fantastic. I'd like to say a word then um, from the O&M. We do have a strong price pressure coming down for the whole industry. And for me as a, a developer, a pr providing a solution to management, we of course are scrutinized on the cost. So if we are going to invest more than we currently do in our existing fleet, we then need to find that from some other part of the business. So that's going to be a tug of war, of course. But we do recognize that this is change is needed and we're currently looking at where can we find extra money to support this in the initial phases. So we know it's a challenge. It's okay. just a case of how much can we put towards it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Another question, if I may, um, I referenced earlier in the, in the presentation, the, um, the very ambitious targets that have been very publicly stated by Orsted in terms of decarbonizing its, uh, its, its offshore wind operations. Um, what, what does that do to the industry? So, you know, either yourself, Ken, as a, as a, 
um, OEM providing, uh, you know, service warranty, uh, Brin, I suppose, providing vessels into sites or, or others. Um, how much of uh, stimulus d does that provide um, to the market? How much of an incentive um, to then go on and kind of develop potentially at risk? Perhaps I can say again, um, it's an obligation. We must. So I would imagine that 90% uh, of our uh, emissions are from their supply chain, their value chain. So for them to achieve that target, they need the full supply chain to change. Yeah. So it's an obligation. I think in addition to that as, as well, Stuart, the, the fact that obviously Orsted and, and other energy companies are looking at this decarbonisation of their entire supply chain via companies like Siemens and the OEMs. I think one of the issues is there's still that price pressure, like you say, which is obviously dictated by the strike price that they can sell the electricity off the uh, off the wind farm to the grid at. Mm. And I think this is where, for example, what we've done at HST is we've looked at it from a hybrid solution in the first instance, so that basically their supply chain costs uh, don't just skyrocket, and and it's actually something that's unsustainable against the prices that they've uh, that they've initially quoted or they won the business on, hopefully what that will then also mean is that technology gets into the marketplace, it begins to gain traction as a hybrid solution, then hopefully moving through to something like what Leo and, and Tidal Transits are looking at uh, with a fully electrified solution. Um, and, and I think that that's a, a process that's going to be ongoing and that technology needs to be brought into the market to then, uh, you know, to gain traction uh, and actually start to honour these obligations that are being put through by the likes of Orsted. Excellent. Thanks, Brent. Um, I had a question from uh, from someone that's come through anonymously, but nevertheless, I'd, I'd like to take it, which is around the role of subsidy. So, um, you know, the cost pressures we've mentioned and, and uh, the continued uh, downward cost in terms of um, uh, strike prices uh, does mean it's a real challenge. Is there a role for subsidy? Um, and government intervention, do we feel? Or is this something industry can achieve uh, on its own? Let me take us. If not, I'll, uh, it's perhaps a, a little contentious. No, Stuart, I think, I think that the, there's, when it comes to going green, it's, it's the initial capital that needs to be, uh, that needs to be managed. If, if you look at, for our project, for example, if you look at the project over a 20 year period, the, and the and the capital cost that has to go out, to go in up front in terms of the infrastructure that's required that infrastructure is is, is still going to be absolutely operational and required for this industry in 20 30 40 years so the if you look at the depreciation cost you can depreciate over a very very long period the actual operating cost of 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 the of the the electricity that's being used to to charge the uh, charge any vessels is 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 very very low you know you, you can take power directly from the turbine no transmission loss um yeah. it's it, i'm not sure where it, it for us for the ctv side i'm not sure where the subsidy would be required in terms of you know really developing new technologies and and, and making hydrogen for example much more commercially viable and understanding that 98 percent of the world's hydrogen available now is it comes comes from fossil fuels that type of industry requires a subsidy as a whole to convert the hydrogen in industry into a green industry. But in terms of electricity and using electricity in either CTVs or in charging SOVs so that they can use um, some, some power, you know, that technology is ready today and, and f financially viable, commercially viable. Mm. Okay, thanks, Lou. Kerry, yeah. Yeah, I'd just like to add to that as well that the, uh, the UK, UK government today uh, have asked for, for comments fed back to them about the reintroduction of the home shipbuilding credit guarantee scheme in the UK, uh, which were people that are aware of it. It was um, originally uh, scrapped in 2004, uh, but they're looking at the potential to reintroduce it and they're looking for feedback on that scheme. And I think that would be also an extremely valuable commitment to the UK shipbuilding and, uh, and, and also purchasing industry. Okay, thanks, Craig. Um, I'm going to have to kind of wrap up fairly shortly in order to, to fit in the final session. Um, but there was uh, an, another question I'd like to ask, and Rob uh, from Rob Stewart from AMC has, has now been able to join us. Rob, um, apologies, you were having technical difficulties. Um, it, it's about the the role and the potential, I suppose, of, of offshore charging, but also, I guess, in time, alternative fuel production. And I suppose mm. as we move in time to 
um, merchant sites and, and potential post subsidy sites. I wonder how much of an incentive um, it is to, to operators in the industry, but also how technically feasible it is to be able to have these platforms offshore that perhaps produce hydrogen, uh, ammonia, or, or store electrical charge. Um, and Rob, I suppose it's an opportunity for you to say a little bit about the innovation you were due to speak about. Yeah, sure. Well, firstly, I apologise for the Isle of Wight, but our um, Wi-Fi isn't as good as it should be. And this morning, the post office decided it'd be a really great idea to dig a hole out of my office, hence I'm back home. Um, for people that don't know us, AMC are um, a CTV manufacturer. We've actually produced something approaching 90 CTVs. Unfortunately, we don't always operate under the AMC banner. Um, we're part of the Isle of Wight shipyard group, but we actually make boats for most people. Um, in fact, I think we have a, a boat being made at present for one of the participants. So at present, I've got two CTVs in build, both hybrid and a further two on order. So we are at the cutting edge of what we do. And we thought the best idea really would be is to actually develop along with my esteemed colleagues here, a way of actually charging batteries in the field. Not necessarily supplying, sorry, charging the boats themselves with their own batteries, but actually having battery packs available out on the fields. So we start on batteries, we use diesel power to do our transit, and then we actually transfer to a battery pack for the day anything one one and a half two three nine tons of batteries whatsoever needed deposit them back and go back to shore on diesel power um how feasible is that we think it's ready today um things holding it up are capital obviously and a real a real desire from the industry really to go green uh, i know leo is um a great protagonist in this we actually had a boat, what, three years ago, where we could have actually achieve near zero carbon. Unless the industry wants to take it up and indeed is prepared to pay for it, it ain't going to happen. We see subsidies for road transport. We see subsidies for lorries, cars, coaches. Um, if we could see the same sort of enthusiasm from government, I think zero carbon generation is actually achievable within five years and not within a generation, as that people have said. So if the incentive is there, certainly the technology is already there and is actually catching up on a daily basis. So um, it, it's up for us to make it happen. And let's say we can go somewhere along there as manufacturers. Again, to actually make a, an all electric boat is a very expensive tool at present. And I will put a figure on it. It's about two million quid more expensive. So we, we've got to A, get that price down or find a more efficient way of doing it. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Rob. Um, and thank you very much to, to all of you on the panel and those who presented. Um, I'm really mindful of time and I want to give uh, proper time to the next speaker and also to the uh, round table discussion. Um, so I'll hand over now to, uh, to Carolina. Um, Carolina, if you could introduce yourself, that would be great. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Carolina Scudero. I work for Vattenfall Network Solutions. And I am going to try to share my screen. And let's see if this works. Similar to, yeah, I think we have it. Uh, you should be seeing my screen now. Let me know if you are not seeing my screen. Um, but hi, welcome everyone. So as I said, my name is Carolina Scudero. I work for Vattenfall Network Solutions, so I actually don't work for WIND, and I'll explain that in a bit. And today I'm going to talk about UK as a global leader in the clean maritime industry. That's great. However, when Stuart approached me to talk about this section, he actually, the, the subtitle was, how did industry and government collaborate to enable this? And I, the first thing I thought was, oh, did we solve it already? Like, how did government and industry collaborate to enable this? Uh, well, I don't think we've solved it yet. So I, then we agreed, actually, let's change the title to how can industry and government collaborate to enable this? Because we're definitely not there yet. 
so oh, let me, yeah. If you have been in one of my presentations before, I always start with this slide because I need to tell you a little bit about that and fall. So we are all about fossil free within a generation or maybe sooner, who knows? And um, we have been around for a hundred years. We have more than 20,000 employees, but what is key that I want to highlight here is that I actually belong to a part of Vattenfall called distribution. So I am not from the wind department. We are a separate business unit. We are an enabler of projects. And actually here, even though I'm not gonna talk about what I do, I can provide infrastructure ownership and CapEx investments for shore power, port electrical infrastructure, but also onboard the vessel, hybrid electric, you name it. So talk to me after the presentation if you want. But today I'm gonna talk about how can industry and government collaborate to enable such vision. So let's start with the five major channel engines. So I speak to, every day I speak to ports and to vessel owners, um, trade bodies, etc., and they always tell me the same thing. First of all, the time to charge if it's battery powered and the infrastructure that is available, that is required um, where, wherever the charging is going to happen. There's limited choice of low carbon technologies for long distance use. There's this issue of backing the right technology and the lack of standards. Willingness to pay, who will pay, we know is more expensive, so what's happening? And there's also always a question that we tend not to talk about it very often in this, uh, in, in this uh, uh, webinars, but I think it's interesting to point out that is it really green? So we need to talk about the low, whole life cycle emissions and how are we going to tackle that? And I don't know if you've noticed, but actually these are not the five major challenges for the decarbonization of the offshore wind and shipping sectors. This is the five major challenges facing electric vehicles as of September 2019. However, we actually have tackled the EV revolution, as they call it. Right now, a lot of us might have EVs or we know someone that has an EV. Uh, EVs has, have grown exponentially and it's great to see that. However, as Rob pointed out before I started, government measures have encouraged that uptake of EVs because EVs are more expensive than a normal car, or at least they were definitely when they were starting out. And the, there was lack of choice. It's not that you can just go ahead and buy whatever car you wanted and it was be an EV. So past and current governments have supported measures that have encouraged that uptake of electric vehicles through a mixture of policies and targets and not just electric vehicles for private consumption but also for fleets buses etc and they addressed the charging infrastructure the v they have vehicle grants low emission zones and penalties so there was clear regulation of what what especially in cities of what could be done and there were clear targets so government enabled the change and then others followed so the willingness to pay started being developed so by um, by companies but also by people and startups who started redesigning the vehicle as a device on wheels so instead of of thinking oh i have this diesel car and i want to make it electric or they started thinking oh how can i make something that takes me from a to b in the lowest emission possible there was academia and industry collaboration and other innovations that helped <clears throat> Then we have a plan. So we have a plan on how we want to get there. And Stuart and uh, who else? Yeah, Stuart and I don't remember who uh, sp spoke about this. So we have the Maritime 2050 and the Clean Maritime Plan. We have a vision to be proactive, to lead the zero emission shipping in UK waters, and we want to be there by 2050. So far, I've seen sustainability has strongly been highlighted in government and industry, which is great. And steps have, are largely driven by innovation rather than regulation. So, so far we're getting there, but it's more because people are being proactive to do it. There is a commitment regarding infrastructure. And as we've seen, there has been funding open for decarbonization of industrial clusters and Marry UK as, as we discussed before. And, the regulation that needs to follow by 2020, we will establish the Maritime Emission Regulation Advisory Service. So far, obviously, that, that hasn't happened, or at least I'm not aware that it has, but 
as you know, 2020 has been quite a challenging year, but there was a consultation of free ports that ran from February to July 2020, and there is an element of sustainability in free ports as well, because ports are a key enabler in this um, clean maritime plan. Not only they are a key enabler for the clean maritime um, industry in general. So, talking about ports, uh, there is a great report from DNVGL on this ports gateway to Europe. They have summarized it in the 10 green transitions, so the commandments of what needs to happen in order to go green. Um, it, it's a, a very standard list and I have highlighted the ones that also apply for vessels. Electrification of port connected activities, fuel switch, electrification of industry, etc, etc. So it's like if, if you came to this presentation and uh, was hoping that I was going to give you the answer, well, I'm sorry, but there's not a single answer. This is something that we need to start tackling the challenges together. And even it would be easy for me to say, well, we need grants and we need regulation, but we also need to, like, we need to focus on a lot of the common themes that are occur that are happening and that a lot of you have mentioned throughout the day. Lack of funding, no standardization, and please don't focus on the standardization in the work boat element of the CTVs, SOVs, but also think wider. Think about the, all of the port users so that the shore power can also be standardized for all of the other vessels. That's important too. We're trying to solve new problems with old mentalities, not always, but in some cases. Work boat solutions might not be the same as other marine industries. So this is another point that I said, um, that I just touched on earlier. Let's try to relieve the complexities on the port by having a standard solution that works not only for work boats, but for the rest of the vessels. We are working in silos. Uh, there is this risk of investing in the wrong technology or a perceived risk and we are talking about low margins or at least high upfront costs so we have a vision and um, by 2050 the uk has taken a proactive role in driving the transition in zero emission shipping uh, in uk waters and is seen globally as a role model it moves faster than other countries by creating international standards. And it has successfully captured the economic, environmental, and health benefits. So I wanted to pull out the, the vision to actually see what needs, to be, what needs to happen to make that vision a reality. We need to organize our efforts around that vision. And this is how industry and government collaborate to enable this reality. We need to be a proactive role model, and that means that there's industry-led initiatives such as the ones that we have here, here today, and I am happy that I can participate in some of them and that I'm here talking about it. But we also need government-led initiatives, and we need them to talk to each other. If we want fast-paced change, then we need regulatory sandboxes that allows us to create this innovation, as, as I believe Kerry was saying, electrical infrastructure with hydrogen infrastructure. Let's try to see if there's a regulatory sandbox that allows us to be more clever in terms of the infrastructure required in the port. We also need first mover incentives. If, for example, Leo uh, creates his all electric CTV, why not have a first mover incentive rather than having to convince people to invest in the vision? And also the economic growth. We need an attractive funding environment and we need solutions to green grid funding that don't necessarily only fall in the port or only fall, fall in the first mover that is going to have the first electric or hybrid CTV in the port to actually pay for that infrastructure. We need to have visibility of all of the aims, challenges and the results across these initiatives and hence catapults and other um, other bodies are really helpful here to keep us together and keep us talking. Now, this is the questions that I want to start the um, uh, round table with because there is a lot to unpack here. How can industry and government collaborate to create or to bring the UK as, as this beacon of green shipping? Well, we need to get over the first hurdles. How do we get over the hurdle of profitability? How do we get over the hurdle of long-term contracts? So I hear that a lot. Be not being in wind, I hear it from the other side uh, that 
obviously, if uh, the vessel operators and owners are undertaking such capital costs, there is something that needs to give in terms of the commercial structure that we currently use for vessels. There's lack of rewards or penalties. And what are going to be the winners and losers in all of this? We need to understand that. How do we ensure visibility across initiatives? And something that I want each of you to do, especially those who are watching the webinar is, how do you fit in this stakeholder wheel? And do you at least know one or two individuals or companies that can help you and can actually, in your projects, are you engaging with at least one of them? Because this is such a problem that we cannot deal, it, deal with it in a silo. And how are we gonna take decisions without regulatory incentives? Because regulation takes time. Yes, there is this clean maritime plan and we know we're gonna get there, but until we do, if by 2050, which is only five years, well, it's literally four years because this year is almost over, uh, all vessels are going to, uh, new vessels are going to be ordered as zero emission. Um, if this doesn't become, say, a proper regulatory incentive, then how are we going to take those decisions? And I want to open the floor now for uh, all of the panelists to join me in a roundtable discussion. And Stuart, I don't know how you want to um, handle this. Should we all turn on our videos or... What yeah, I think if, if those who've been on the panel today could turn on videos, um, I'll also be keeping an eye out for questions from uh, attendees, mm -hmm. fire questions or, or contributions through uh, the Q&A function. Mm -hmm. But Carolina, thank you. That was a, an excellent presentation. And I think, like you say, it doesn't necessarily give the answers, but it certainly presents the right questions. And I, I think, you know, for me, at least, it feels as though that's where we are currently um, as kind of, uh, you know, UK industry looking to move on this um, and, and the multiple other stakeholders i think there are still an awful lot of questions uh, yeah. a lot of work still to be done i guess a question i'd like to ask you carolina maybe just to kick us off is the importance of, of supply chain and i guess there are two approaches we could either kind of wait for wait for industry to, to um, deliver solutions here um, or we could take a more arguably more interventionist approach and kind of have the supply chain stimulation now um, slightly contentious, but arguably with offshore wind, we did the former. We, we waited for the market to respond and provide mm -hmm. security at low cost. How important do you think is um, supply chain stimulation in, in decarbonisation? Extremely, especially because what we're what Rob was saying before is that the delta uh, between a normal vessel or a diesel power vessel and an all electric or, or low carbon vessel we're talking is 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 quite dramatic. So we are not going to get those new solutions or we're not going to get the, uh, those insights from academia or from the startups telling us which is the right technology to support unless there's support for them to start investigating what is the right thing to do. And that is also why I like the, um, the project from BB Marine, which is like, okay, let's, let's try investigating this, not just for ourselves, but also for the wider uh, for the wider shipping industry. Something yeah. that, I'm, that I highlight a lot when I speak to ports is, okay, you have to, the ports need to speak to their customers and their customers are usually a mixture of the likes of yourselves so or the offshore wind industry, but also there are other users or potential users that all need to be aligned. And the standardization is going to play a key part um, on this. So government intervention will only not, wouldn't just help the wind industry, it will actually help the shipping industry. And that's also how we need to sell it, that it's not just for one industry, it's for the wider shipping segment. Yeah. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I guess question to some of the vessel operators on the, on the panel. Um, how much do you view kind of port infrastructure as a, as a challenge, as a barrier? Do you find port operators are generally very quick to provide the infrastructure that's needed um, to support these alternate vessel types? Or, or is it a bit of a battle? Um, you know, how, uh, what are some of the good and bad examples perhaps that you've seen? Yeah, Stuart, I think it's a good question. I, I, I think that, um, the way that we've been looking at it is actually the cost of putting the infrastructure in place, the extensive infrastructure in place in, in many of the port sites that are currently being used for offshore wind 
And considering some of them are very small harbors, like, you know, like wells next to sea near us, for example, mm. uh, the cost of putting massive electrical infrastructure in there to be able to charge vessels is not realistic. Whereas the cost of um, putting a charger onto the substation at the wind farm, which has a three and a half megawatt capacity already, mm. is much more realistic in terms of, uh, of expendable uh, capital. Uh, and you know, the charging capacity is just much greater than you'd be able to get from a, uh, um, a, a, a very hefty infrastructure investment in the port. Um, but I think, you know, I guess ours is, might be more of a specialist case, but, and, and I think it runs through into, into Rob's, Rob's project really of you know, utilizing the vast amount of electricity that's being produced offshore and use that power offshore rather than having to force the many of the ports to invest in the infrastructure that's required. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Leo. Kerry. Um, yeah, Kerry. All right. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's also quite a fine balance as well between uh, what levels of the supply and um, and chartering chain. Uh, do you find the commitment, the requirement, the expectation, and the appreciation? Um, as we said earlier, commitment can be an issue because without a commitment, for example, from a charter, then uh, vessel owners or operators are looking at having to build vessels on speculation. Um, but would those vessels that are built on speculation meet the requirement of a charterer? And the same is also for the equipment that's being uh, being built or designed by the separate uh, equipment manufacturers if it doesn't meet the, the shipyards or the vessel owners requirements. What are the expectations across the whole supply chain? So what are our expectations from government, from the, the wind farm operators, the vessel owners and the supply chain manufacturers? And also, are we all appreciative that this isn't going to be a 100% easy transition? There is gonna be ups and downs and uh, there'll be good days and bad days um, but that is required in order to, to, to reach our target. And as we said earlier, or as I said earlier, it's a living status. How do we be as green as we possibly can at the moment? And, and in 10 years time, we have to have gone through that, you know, roller coaster to get there. But first of all, we just need people to put pen to paper. I don't think anyone in the supply chain would say they're not ready. Yeah. I think what that, to add to what Kerry was saying as well, Stuart, I think what, that boils down to from a vessel operator's perspective is we have to have good stakeholder engagement as well. And there has to be um, that dialogue between the people that are writing this into their supply chain requirements um, and the people that are actually going to have to deliver it. So, you know, there has to be, there can't be that disconnect of we want this, but we're not willing to talk about how we're going to implement it. Um, because at the end of the day, then the vessel operators are very unlikely uh, to put their best foot forward and potentially uh, build things on speculation, knowing that they're putting the uh, the right vessels into the market. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you, Brent. Um, I'm really mindful of time, and I'm being kind of prompted to to wrap up as quickly as I can uh, to let the next session go ahead. Just just one final question to anybody. I won't go around everybody, but if anybody wants to offer up. Um, a single thing that either they would like to see government or industry uh, lead on, a, a wish, if you want a, a single wish, what might it be? Anybody want to kind of come in with anything there? For me, it has to be regulation. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Leo. Go ahead. Sorry, yeah. Standardization of connectors for me, because I, I dread the thought of there being lots of different types and and uh, every port having a different type and therefore not being able to utilize yeah. them all. That's something right. in very, very key. Think, I also think we should um, look to have integrated fleets and not have one boat doing everything, the, the jack of all trades. Um, there really is no incentive to have specialist boats because you know, the boats are only chartered for three years or so. But whereas, Leo, if you wanted a, a refueling boat, a recharging boat, a painting boat or whatever, it would make more sense to have a fleet of boats that did specialist jobs, especially if you could have a long-term charter, and therefore you could actually operate your boats far more efficiently. Interesting. Yeah, I'd also like to say that, that we need to look internationally and we also need to play internationally. Um, we don't want the UK to be driving on the left, the rest of the world on the right. Um, we need to be supplying systems that can not only support uh, non-UK vessels coming into the UK, but also that vessels built in the UK can be exported to, country, to international countries 
and that also operated, vessels operated from the UK, <clears throat> will be able to go um, all across the world and also still be supported in those countries as well. Yeah, agreed. Excellent. Carolina, you were going to make a point, weren't you? Yeah, for me, uh, when, when I was starting to prepare the presentation, for me, it's regulation. So obviously, standardization is important and we need to think about, we almost need to rethink commercially how we operate our fleets but at the end of the day we also need a regulation to move us forward and that's what moved the ev revolution forward if it wasn't for the zero emission zone and ultra emission zone here in london we wouldn't have seen a lot of the projects that are happening at the moment so obviously for me beyond just the offshore wind sector but in shipping in general we need that regulation to happen sooner than later. And there will be winners and losers. And that's sure. something that we're just going to have to manage. Yeah, yeah. Okay, wonderful. I would love to push my luck even harder, um, but I'm receiving uh, virtual elbows from uh, from the team to say, move along. So um, thank you ever so much to everybody who's contributed on, on panels and speakers. It's been fantastic conversation and uh, really appreciate your time. And thanks to those who've uh, tuned in as well to, to listen.